Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, A Study in Scarlet. Part 1. Dr. Watson Meets Sherlock Holmes. Once upon a time in London, a man named Dr. Watson needed a place to live. His friend said, I know someone who also needs a roommate. His name is Sherlock Holmes. Watson was curious. Sherlock Holmes? He asked. Who is he? His friend smiled. He's a bit unusual. He notices tiny things most people don't see. But you might like him. So Watson went to meet Sherlock at 221 B Baker Street. Sherlock was tall and had bright eyes that sparkled when he looked at things. He lived in a big house filled with books, strange tools, and items like half-smoked cigars and a coal scuttle or bullets sticking into the woodwork of the walls. As Watson entered, Sherlock looked at him and said, Ah, an army doctor just returned from Afghanistan. How do you do? Watson was surprised. How did you know that? He asked. Sherlock chuckled, rubbing his long fingers together. He loved showing off his skills. It's simple, he said, pointing at Watson's suntanned face and his injured arm. Your tan says you were in a hot place. Your injury tells me you were in a war. I know about the war in Afghanistan. Watson was amazed. Sherlock's skills were like magic. He decided then, this man is unique, and living with him will be an adventure. And so began their journey of friendship and solving mysteries together. From that day, 221 B Baker Street was never the same. It became a home of deduction, courage, and endless adventures. After moving in, Watson spent more time with Sherlock. He noticed how Sherlock would often gaze at objects or sit with his eyes closed, deep in thought. What are you doing, Sherlock? Watson asked one day. I'm practicing my science of deduction, Sherlock replied, opening his eyes to look at Watson. Watson was puzzled. Science of deduction? What is that? Sherlock explained, by noticing small details, I can understand big things. For example, your muddy shoes tell me that you walked in the park today. Watson was surprised. Yes, that's right. But how did you know? Sherlock pointed at Watson's shoes. See, there are unique types of mud. The mud on your shoes is from the park near our house. So, I know you were there. Watson was impressed. Every day with Sherlock was full of new surprises. He learned that noticing small details can reveal a big story. Watson felt lucky to live with such a clever friend, and he looked forward to their first big adventure. Little did he know that it would come sooner than he thought. Are you enjoying this story? Let us know by tapping the like button. Thank you. One morning. Sherlock and Watson heard about a strange happening. A man named Enoch Drebber was found in a house in Lauriston Garden. He looked very scared and then, he suddenly couldn't wake up anymore. Nobody knew what had happened. Sherlock was very interested. A mystery. He said, Watson, shall we go? Sherlock, with his sharp eyes, started looking around. He bent down and studied the ground carefully. Look. Watson, he said, pointing at the footprints. The footprints of a man with square-toed boots. And see this. The footprints are deeper than usual. Our man was carrying something heavy. Next, Sherlock saw something on a wall. A word was written in big letters, Ra. Watson looked puzzled. What does it mean, Sherlock? He asked. Sherlock looked thoughtful. It's a clue, Watson, he said. A clue that we need to figure out. Sherlock also found a ring on the floor. He carefully picked it up. Sherlock thought hard. He said, Watson, 
I think a man who drives a cab did this. The footprints match his boots. And this ring, it was not Mr. Drebber's. This ring may lead us to the person who killed Mr. Drebber. The mystery was getting bigger and Sherlock was excited. He was like a hunter tracking a puzzle. Watson was amazed by Sherlock's skills, and he couldn't wait to solve the mystery. Their adventure had begun. Back at their house, Sherlock and Watson started piecing together the clues. They had the footprints, the word Raha, and the ring. But how did they fit together? Just then, a man named John Rance arrived. He was a policeman and had been in the garden too. He had seen some strange things that night. John Rance told them about the night Mr. Drebber got killed. The policeman was patrolling the streets when he saw a light in the garden. He went to check and found Mr. Drebber lying on the floor inside the house. I found Mr. Drebber. He looked very scared. Then he fell down and didn't wake up. I saw the word Raha on the wall too. He also mentioned that he saw a cab nearby. But when he approached, the cab drove off quickly. He didn't get a good look at the driver. But he remembered the number of the cab. It was 2704. John Rance's story added more pieces to the puzzle. Sherlock and Watson thanked him for his help. They knew they were closer to finding out what happened, but there were still missing pieces. After John Rance left, Sherlock and Watson talked about the clues. They wondered about the cab driver. Was he involved in what happened to Mr. Drebber? And what about the word Raha? What did it mean? Sherlock looked at Watson and said, Watson, the answer is in the clues. We just need to connect the dots. Let's continue our investigation. We're getting closer to solving this mystery. And with that, they set off on their next adventure, ready to discover the truth behind the mystery at the Lauriston Garden. Sherlock and Watson were puzzling over their clues. The ring was especially interesting. Who did it belong to? How did it end up at the crime scene? Sherlock decided to find out. Sherlock put an ad in the newspaper. The ad said they found a ring. If anyone lost it, they could come to 221 B Baker Street to get it. Days passed. One morning, there was a knock on the door. A woman, all in black, was standing outside. She said she had lost a ring. Sherlock showed her the one they found. But it wasn't hers. She left disappointed. Sherlock was excited though. He told Watson, our criminal used this ring to attract Mr. Drebber to the Lauriston Garden. Sherlock was sure that the ring was the key to finding the man who hurt Mr. Drebber. The fact that the ring was not claimed by anyone else suggested that its owner must have a strong reason to avoid reclaiming it, perhaps because they were involved in the crime. If the ring had belonged to an innocent person, they would likely have responded to the advertisement, he explained. As the day ended, Sherlock and Watson felt they were close to solving the mystery. They had the clues in Sherlock's sharp mind. Sherlock was busy at work when Inspector Gregson showed up at Baker Street. He had found a clue about the mystery. It was a pill, one of two found in a box near Mr. Drebber. Sherlock was very interested. He took the pill and studied it. This might be a clue, Sherlock said. Perhaps Mr. Drebber swallowed the other pill and fell asleep forever. Watson watched as Sherlock tested the pill with different chemicals. Sherlock was like a scientist in a laboratory. With every new clue, they were getting closer to the answer. After Gregson left, Sherlock and Watson stayed up late, trying to understand the pill. They even asked a sick dog to eat it, but nothing happened. The dog was fine. Sherlock wasn't discouraged. Every no brings us closer to a yes, he said. He knew that they still had much to learn, but they were not afraid of the dark mystery. They had each other and their brilliant minds. 
Just then, there was a knock on the door. It was another police inspector, Mr. Lestrade. He had caught a cab driver who Sherlock thought was the real attacker. Sherlock was excited. That's more like it, he exclaimed. Everyone gathered around Jefferson Hope, the cab driver. His voice was low but clear, and everyone listened intently. He looked tired and worn out. When they accused him of killing Mr. Drebber, he didn't deny it. Instead, he asked to tell his story. The room grew silent as Jefferson Hope started to speak. This was just the beginning of a story that would take them far beyond the quiet streets of London. Don't miss a single chapter of our extraordinary stories. Hit the subscribe button now. Part 2. The Country of the Saints Now, let's go back in time. Many years ago, there was a man named John Ferrier. He lived in the United States, in a place called the Great Alkali Plain. It was a vast, dry land with no water or trees. John was the only survivor of a wagon group that got lost in this desert. One day, while nearly dying of thirst, John found a little girl alone. She was the only other survivor of another lost group. John named her Lucy. They became like a family, alone in the desert. Just as they were losing hope, they were found by a group of people called the Mormons. Their leader, a man named Brigham Young, helped John and Lucy. They gave them water and food. John was grateful. He and Lucy started a new life with the Mormons, in a city they built called Salt Lake City. John and Lucy lived happily for many years. John started a farm and Lucy grew up to be a lovely young woman. Life in the Great Alkali Plain was hard, but they had each other. They were a family, surviving together in the desert. As time passed, Lucy grew into a beautiful young woman. Everyone in Salt Lake City noticed her. They called her the Flower of Utah. Many young men wanted to marry Lucy, but she had eyes for only one person, a man named Jefferson Hope. Jefferson was a brave man who traveled a lot. But whenever he was in Salt Lake City, he spent time with Lucy. They laughed and talked about their dreams they fell in love and planned to marry. However, the Mormons had strict rules. Their leader, Brigham Young, decided who could marry whom. When he learned about Lucy and Jefferson's love, he was unhappy. He believed Lucy should marry a Mormon man. Two Mormon men, Mr. Drebber and Mr. Stangerson, asked to marry Lucy. They were both older and not kind, but they were wealthy and powerful in Salt Lake City. John was worried. He didn't want Lucy to marry a man she didn't love. Lucy cried and said, I can only love Jefferson. Their peaceful life in Salt Lake City was becoming hard. But they decided to face the challenge together, like they had always done. John was worried about Lucy. He decided to speak to Brigham Young. Lucy loves Jefferson. She doesn't want to marry Mr. Drebber or Mr. Stangerson, John said. Brigham Young was firm. Lucy must follow our rules, he replied. She must marry a Mormon man. John felt upset. He returned home and told Lucy about the talk. Lucy was sad, but she was brave too. I will always love Jefferson, she said. John decided they must leave Salt Lake City. He sent a message to Jefferson Hope. We need your help. Come quickly. When Jefferson got the message, he rode his horse fast. He was determined to save Lucy. But when he arrived at Salt Lake City, John and Lucy were gone. Their house was empty. Jefferson was worried. He knew that the Mormons were strict. He was afraid they might hurt John and Lucy. So he decided to find them. He went into the desert, following their tracks. It was a race against time. 
He knew he had to find Lucy and John before it was too late. Jefferson was brave. He loved Lucy and was ready to face any danger to save her. In the big desert, Jefferson searched for John and Lucy. He saw tracks in the sand. He followed them, hoping to find his love and her father safe. He rode for days and nights, never stopping. He was determined to find Lucy and protect her. Meanwhile, John and Lucy were trying to escape. They were scared, but they had each other. We must be strong, Lucy, John said. We must get far away from Salt Lake City. One day, Lucy saw a cloud of dust in the distance. Father, look, she cried. They watched as the cloud came closer. It was a group of horse riders. They were the Mormons, coming to take Lucy back. John and Lucy tried to escape, but the Mormons were too fast. They were surrounded. John tried to protect Lucy, but the Mormons were strong. They took Lucy away and left John alone in the desert. John was heartbroken. He had lost his little girl, but he didn't lose hope. He knew Jefferson was coming to help them. As he lay alone in the desert, John hoped Jefferson would find Lucy and keep her safe. Meanwhile, Jefferson was still following their tracks, racing against time to save Lucy. Jefferson found John in the desert. John was very weak, but he told Jefferson about the Mormons and Lucy. Jefferson was sad to hear about John's fate but was determined to save Lucy. Find Lucy. Save her from the Mormons, John said before he closed his eyes forever. Jefferson promised to fulfill John's last wish. Jefferson went to Salt Lake City to find Lucy. But it was too late. Being forced to marry men she didn't love made her so unhappy that she passed away. When Jefferson found out, his heart was broken. He'd lost the one he loved the most. But he didn't let his sadness stop him. He went to Lucy's funeral. There, he took a ring from Lucy's hand. This ring was a symbol of his love for her. It was also a reminder of the promise he made to himself. I will make Mr. Drebber and Mr. Stangerson pay for this, he vowed. So, he started a long journey. He followed the two men from place to place, through different countries and cities. All this time, he kept Lucy's ring with him. The ring reminded him of Lucy and his promise to her. The room was quiet when Jefferson finished his story. Even Sherlock, who always had something to say, was silent. Watson could see that Jefferson's tale had moved him. It was clear now why Jefferson had done what he did. But that didn't change the fact that he had broken the law. Sherlock and Watson had solved the mystery. The strange word Raha was German for revenge. The man who wrote it was Jefferson Hope. He had come to London to find Mr. Drebber and Mr. Stangerson. Sherlock asked, So you made Drebber swallow one of the two pills, just one, harmless or deadly? Jefferson nodded. It was his chance, just as he gave Lucy a chance. But what about Mr. Stangerson? Watson asked. Ah, him, Hope replied with a grimace. I didn't forget him. I followed him to Halliday's private hotel, where he stayed. Jefferson explained how he had tried to give Stangerson a chance to choose a pill before he met the same fate as Drebber. But Stangerson refused to take the pill and fought back. They started fighting and Jefferson had to protect himself. Stangerson was killed by accident. The police found the same poison pill near Stangerson's body that Drebber had eaten. The police took Jefferson away. Sherlock and Watson were left in the quiet room, their minds filled with the sad story they had just heard. Despite the sorrowful end, they knew they had solved the mystery. As they went to bed that night, the house seemed a little quieter, the world a little sadder. But the truth had been discovered and justice would be done. Finally, 
Jefferson was arrested for his actions. But he died from an old heart problem before the trial. With Jefferson's story, Sherlock and Watson had all the pieces of the puzzle. Sherlock said to Watson, Every mystery has a story, Watson. We just have to find it. And so, Sherlock and Watson solved that first big mystery. They felt sad for Jefferson, Lucy, and John. But they were also happy. They had used their wits and bravery to find the truth. As they sat in their room at 221 B. Baker Street, they knew this was just the beginning of their adventures together. They looked forward to the next mystery that awaited them. The End Have you enjoyed this story? Like and subscribe to our channel now to unlock fresh tales and level up your English skills.